And with that, Susan, thank you for spending some time with us this afternoon. I'm going to turn it right over to you. Super. This will be fun. Um, do I have the ability to share my screen? It looks like I do. I will make sure you do if you don't. Okay. I, I do have just a couple of slides I'm going to put up today. Um, and I hope you're all wearing pants because we're actually going to um, <laughs> do actually some moving around. Or at least I hope you're going to join me in in some play with this today. <laughs> yeah, surprise, surprise, right? Um, so um, because we're going to try to get out of our heads today. That's the whole plan. So welcome. People are still popping on. This is great. Um, so there's a title. Let me go ahead and share while I'm talking about it here. Um, there it is. And I should probably put that into, hold on a second. Talk amongst yourselves. I'm going to go ahead and put that into um, presentation mode before I share. And there it is. I do, I do have a question for you. How did you come up with this topic, Susan? Uh, I woke up um, with it in my head um, and wrote it ah, down. Which and, is pretty funny for getting it out of your head. Yeah, I literally woke up with it in my head and I, I, I wrote it down. Um, and then I, um, I thought, well, you know, I should probably tell somebody about this one. And so... <laughs> I did, and um, that's how it happened. And then I didn't even title it. I said, I think there's a session, something about such and such or other. Um, and Wendy said, okay, we'll call it this. <laughs> so I give, I give the title full credit um, to Wendy um, uh, or whoever it was that actually came up with this particular title. So let's see if I can make this go as part. There we go. So this is, um, this is it. So it's techniques to take clients out of their heads in coaching. Um, that is what we are uh, dealing with today. Um, and I, there's a couple of reasons. If, if I think it, it, I've been getting all sorts of crazy inspiration. Um, and some of them come in the middle of the night and I wake up and I write them down. I don't even know what they are until the next day. Um, but this one came, I think, from a conversation I had with another affiliate about how um, we're all sort of learning to breathe again. Um, after the pandemic, I feel like the whole world stopped breathing there for a while. Um, and, and so really kind of finding, finding our feet again, finding our breath again, finding our bodies again. Um, and between that and then some other work that I've just been doing about um, learning how to respond to my own body, which I, you know, mostly ignored for the first however many years of its life. So, um, so then here we are, techniques to take clients out of their heads in coaching. So my plan today um, is to share just a little bit of information with you around the mind-body connection and have some conversation about that. We'll talk about what it looks like when our clients are stuck, um, what it sounds like, so we can kind of get a feel for when some of this stuff might come into play. And then I've just got three different techniques to share with you today. Um, and I'm sure you'll have more to add to the discussion um, I'm also going to throw out an opportunity for somebody to sort of be the guinea pig and coaching on the second technique. So if somebody's feeling their urge or has something to work through um, that they're willing to sort of be in the, in the hot seat, that'd be great. And then we'll do more discussion and sharing and takeaways at the end. So pretty quick and easy and down and dirty here. Um, first thing I need you to do actually is start is think about, think about and make a note about um, pen and paper or handy. I'm gonna, follow the lead here of Nancy um, Prophet from the other day. Um, what are you thinking about? Uh, come up with a, think of a, about a problem you're trying to solve, can be personal, can be professional, can be something that's been stuck in your head, that's been sort of rolling around up there, you haven't made a decision about it, not sure, something you would like some coaching on, because you're going to have an opportunity to do some self-coaching today through the process that we're going to go through. So that is my first step. Uh, um, suggestion for you is if, as we go through these first couple of slides is think about a problem that you can put some focus and energy on today. So basically by the end, you have maybe a little more motion in terms of where you want to go with your own problem. You'll have a couple of techniques you can take with you and use with your clients. Um, and we'll see if, you know, we all learn something today. So there you go. Those are my objectives. All right. So let's see if I can make my thing go forward here. Sometimes it does not. 
right, why doesn't it? There it goes. All right, good, we figured it out. So the mind-body connection. Uh, I, I don't know how much um, studying you guys have done around how the mind and the body kind of work together. I've been doing a lot of it, um, trying to understand me. So, um, you know, because as much as I say, everything's not about me, everything actually is about me, which is a really interesting contradiction from what I was taught as a child. Um, so what I've got here in the photo is um, the picture of the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is this lovely thing, hey, um, that connects the, the body and the mind. Um, and really everything uh, they've proven through heart math and, and some other um, institutes, you can do all sorts of research, research on this stuff. If you haven't already, you're probably preaching to the choir, but really our information comes into our body and then into our mind. Um, so we have an experience of things in our body and then our meaning is made in the mind. And um, boy, can we make meaning out of stuff. Um, humans are incredible, incredible meaning makers. Um, and I say we've all graduated from MSU, make stuff up. Um, and basically whatever feeling we've had that's stronger, the experience or the emotion of the experience in the body of any thing that's going on with us, the stronger the memory is in the mind. And um, it creates a very, very strong neural pathway that we tend to repeat because it was so strong as an experience or as an emotion. So that thing gets myelinated um, and it gets stuck in there. Um, and as you know, our habits of thinking, right? This is how our habits of thinking are actually created is through this mind body experience that we're having. And in life, we experience the result of our thinking super directly like more directly than I think we could even explain to someone. We experience the results of our thinking. Um, so um, when we get stuck in our heads, um, the other thing I like about this drawing, uh, when we get stuck in our heads, look, look underneath the, right? There's, there's a whole bunch of extra stuff underneath my head um, that's handy to work with, right? That I'm forgetting about if I'm only coaching my brain, um, if only working with somebody when they're dealing with their brain. So we, we tend to forget that we're made up of more stuff than just what happens up here. So yeah. Um, what do you think about that? Thoughts, ideas, anything everybody's thinking as I'm talking about the mind and body connection? So I'm, so yeah. Susan, I got a quick question. So maybe sure. it's not so quick. So the vagus nerve I've known about, you know, and that's why gut feel is right. And that's why we feel in our heart. We also know about the limbic system and the amygdala that kind of controls the communication between the rest of your brain and the, the limbic. Is the vagus nerve part of the limbic system? Or is it Technically, separate? It, it is, um, I consider it part of the limbic system, yeah, it's part of the entire nervous situation. Um, but it, it operates a little bit in, I, I like to think of it as, as sort of separate as well. So I think the scientists would say it's part of it. And the, um, in my mind, I like to think of it as separate because um, when I always think limbic, okay, the, the way it works for me, at least, the way when I think about the limbic brain, I think the, the whole fight flight situation. Um, and I think this is more just information to that system versus so it's, it's the, it's, it, it, it um, somebody else wanted, I, I'm not coming up with words very well. Somebody else have a, a way to describe that better. I just tend to think of them differently. Although I think science thinks of them as together. Somebody else have something different. I admit I'm still learning about this stuff. So. Well, I'm going to admit that I'm just, I'm learning about it too. As a matter of fact, I just sent you a book that I, Susan, that I'm starting on. Um, <laughs> as a result of some barbershop work, believe it or not, called the, the polyvagal theory, the transformative feeling of power, power of feeling safe, the pocket guide, which is anything but a pocket guide. Oh my, oh my God. But ba basically to me, the power of the, of the, vag the vagus nerve is it connects so many of our critical organs up to our body and, and so many more things are controlled by our vagus nerve than I even remotely knew. Yeah, for including, sure. Up to and including respiration, which is so why it's, it's so, the, which is why yeah. it's so critical for the, 
for for barber shoppers to be able to have be able even even where how we how we stand when we're getting ready to perform what goes in and out of alignment has a huge ability in terms of how successful we are at transmitting those neural messages through our brain and what parts of our body open up and what parts of our what parts don't and what kind of alignment takes place instantaneously at the subconscious level i mean it's just it's it's like this incredible key that i just never even knew about for 35 out of 37 years i've been doing this well, and, and then start studying about sound vibration and what that has to do with the chakras. <sighs> okay. So anyway, so it gets, you can go, you can go all over with this. So, so I, you, I, have a, so I have a question that's off of, off of your slide, if I may. Uh, yeah. And that's that third bullet. So are emotions an experience or are they a reaction to an experience? That's always confused me. Trying okay. to plug emotions so, into where all, I mean, I get the other three bullets, but thats that's been a stumper for me for a while. Oh yeah, the whole feelings thing? Yeah, it's that F word, you know, it's, <laughs> I struggle with it. So, <laughs> as you and I both have had many long conversations. I'll, I'll try to put it in as, as sort of layman's <laughs> terms as I can here um, for you there, Rick. No, so no, seriously. So <clears throat> the whole, the, um, we our, our brains are wired literally for safety right they're really trying to keep us physically um psychologically everything safe um and and because of that um it it basically stores information in a way that was to would help us understand if our experience of this feels f word um similar to an experience we've had before um and then whether or not that felt that emotion was strongly safe or strongly not. Um, and, and it makes a yes, no, like ones and zeros, seriously, um, connection. And so, um, you know, the, the easiest way to describe this would be like with a trauma response. If you've had a very, very um, strong emotional um, experience, something that really was a trauma, your brain stores that in a very, you know, uh, you're going to remember that experience. Let me get, let me tell a different story. Um, here's one. So there was, um, I always go back to this story. Um, when I start to think about when I'm coming up with toys where I can take the easy path or the hard path. <laughs> so, uh, I had an MO for a very long time of if something looked harder, that would be the way I would go. Um, and then I went to a ropes course. So back, it was back a few years, I was on a ropes course and we're with this group of people and there were two ways you could get up the tree. Long story short, um, you could take the rope ladder up to the platform, or you could take the ladder that was nailed to the tree, right? You can take the rungs that are actually on the tree and just climb up the ladder like a ladder. And of course, me being who I was at the time, I had to try the rope ladder, which is talk about a whole waste of energy, by the way, trying to get the stupid rope ladder. Um, and, and that was a direct result of my habit of thinking that I needed to overachieve. Um, it was absolutely part of my overachieving um, you know, and, and that my overachiever was a direct result of an experience that I had with my mother. Okay. So it you know, goes back. So I had this, I had had been rewarded many, many times over years and years and years for overdoing it, right. For putting all that extra effort in. And um, so here I go, Oh, I get to choose the easy way or the hard way. I'm going to choose the hard way. Cause that's what I do. I prove myself on the hard way. Um, I didn't get up the rope ladder, by the way, it's a long way up there and it was really hard. And I got done and I made up this story about how I was really proud of myself for trying. And, and then I was like, God, that was really dumb. You know, like later I figured it out, like, that was really dumb. Cause when I went and climbed up the tree, I went bleh, 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 up the damn tree, it was no problem. And, and so we journaled about it later in the course they talked about, you know, think about your toys and why you made it and all that kind of stuff. And um, went back and read my journal, not, 
not that long after that and went, oh my gosh, I see a pattern. So the, but the pattern, again, my, my action, right? Um, my action was driven by an ex basically emotion feelings behind doing it the hard way and getting seen, being recognized, being validated for doing that. Um, and it had, it had, for me, it had totally had to do with filling a self-love hole that I didn't know I couldn't fill from the outside. Um, but, you know, again, that's my story, but it's just an example of how, you know, we have a strong emotional experience. It has a strong kind of memory or place in your mind. And then everything that you're doing in your head is what's um, coming out as the results of your, in, in your life. So this is how this all fits together. Does that help? Cool. No, it does. Thanks. By the way, I'm trying to get over my overachiever just for the for the record. I'm working on it. All right. So I'm trying to take the easy route. If, if you more. have enough beer, that'll fix that problem. <laughs> well, unfortunately, <laughs> no, it doesn't. It just makes you an emotional overachiever. It's just, <laughs> it just doesn't work. So, um, so there we go. So we have a mind and body connection. All right, so how do you know if a client is stuck in their head? Because, and, and the reason this is important, I think, is because if they get stuck up there, we can get stuck up there with them. Um, and it's not super helpful. So some of these techniques, by the way, are great for you as their coach, as well as for them as your client. So um, these are a couple that I came up with, you know, the whole, I don't know, I don't know. Um, spinning, going in circles, rambling on and on, um, same problems over and over again that they can't seem to solve, you know, the, the big three worry, anxiety, and stress. Other things that, that you see or hear um, from a client when you know that they're, they're stuck. Go ahead and jump in. You know, I always get the, uh, you know, Rick, that's a really good question. You know, you know what that's code for? Clueless. <laughs> <laughs> I have no I really earthly idea how to answer it. Right. Or you're the coach. Tell me what to do. Yeah. The, yeah. the, uh, the counterpart to Susan's worry and anxiety and stress may also be called FUD, right? Fear, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Doubt, love that one. Awesome. Yeah, so we know, right? We know when we're stuck in our head. We also know when they're stuck in their head. It's so much easier, by the way, other people's lives are so much easier. Um, at least from my perspective, I was thinking way better at other people's lives than I am at my own. All right, cool. All right, so we, we know we get stuck in our head. We know the mind-body connection is important. So let's play with it a little bit. So before we move on, in case you just, just joined us, um, I want hey, you to have a problem that you're stuck in your head about. Yeah, go ahead. You know, one thing that would be different, but I'd like to add to your list if you're building this for future use, a parent values conflicts. Yeah. I saw Patrice give me a big nod on that one. Oh yeah. Doug, say more about that. Well, I go ahead, Doug, if you want to. I was going to say more about But I was shaking my head about. Please <laughs> go ahead. The okay, senator from New Jersey yields his time to Patrice. <laughs> you are so Thank sweet. You. Um, Love it. We were you were talking about a conflict and values, well, values are pretty consistent for a person, but um, we all develop our own belief systems. And our beliefs are not true or false, but they lead to an outcome. And so in that process, when people have conflicts in their belief system, then that means that they're really questioning how the belief system that they have is resolving itself in their body and the way they function and how they think. So whether it's, um, and I look at whether or not when I'm breathing, I look at whether or not something is expanding me or contracting me. If it's contracting me, then I need to look at it from a different perspective. If it's expanding me, then I need to understand where that's going to take me. Wow. Wow. Yes, absolutely. Oh, thank you for the transition. Um, constriction, 
you know, that contraction or constriction is a sign something's wrong. Um, we are really built to be expansive, right? To take up space, to be like our universe, which is just amazing and all creative and all around us. And the more small you think you're, you know, when something's happening where it's constricting and it could be energy anywhere in the body, that's a sign that you're, you're hanging on to something or you're not, something's not flowing the way it should be. So there's something off. There's a, just a definitely a disagreement going on here. Um, and sometimes we can hang on to beliefs that are killing us. Like they're really creating a lot of constriction in our, in our bodies. It's amazing how this works. So yeah. Awesome. A, great, a quick, great, great a quick, knowing that Susan is a singer, that's the, the old adage is t tension anywhere in the body leads to tension in the voice. Absolutely. You know, what's interesting too, my brother noticed that I had been talking with a lower voice and, um, and I noticed that when I talk with, when, when I'm in constriction, my voice lowers wow. when my voice lowers and I talk with a lower voice. I lose my voice faster. So I'm um, interestingly, um, the last couple of weeks, I've made an effort actually of talking with a higher voice so that I don't lose my voice. And naturally now, like today, I didn't even notice it just, you know, as we're talking now, I'm noticing I'm back in my normal voice range as I'm speaking, but it took some effort. Um, and, and as I've made that change, some other things in my life have opened up. So this is how it's all connected and then we're all connected energetically right we are all just energy and then how we interact with our energy so the more constricted we are the more separated we are from really abundance and from you know all sorts of lovely other things in the universe and so it's really about that opening right and when our head gets stuck that's when constriction it's another sign that we're in a constrict more constricted mode Tell me, this stuff is really fun. All right, so I've got three techniques for you today, okay? And I want to spend some time with this, so I'm going to go ahead and jump to it. Um, so find a problem you're in your head about that you want to actually look at from some different perspectives today. Go ahead and make a note, a couple words, something. It could be personal, it could be professional. You don't have to tell me what it is. You don't tell anybody what it is. Um, and... Um, so kind of put something down. So you're gonna kind of self coach through this process. Um, and you're gonna want that pen and paper nearby to take notes, cause we're gonna take you away from it and then come back to it and give you a couple of minutes to, to write things down if you'd like to. Um, and I'm gonna have you get up and move a bit. So if you haven't already put your pants on, please put your pants on. It's a Zoom call, you just never know. I gotta I got put a disclaimer out there, so yeah. Even I wore pants today, so it's all good. All right, you guys ready? Mm -hmm. All right, so number one, something as simple as breathing. So um, this is box breathing. I'm gonna talk you through it, then I'm gonna exit out of my presentation and we're gonna do it together. Uh, I stole this from Brene Brown. Anybody else who's a Brene Brown fan, you may recognize it. Um, this is something really simple you can do with a client because it, it's, it's natural, right? We all breathe. Um, most of us do anyway, most of the time. Um, and um, and it, it, it's not so far, some of the stuff that you're gonna go, woo, this is maybe out of their realm sometimes, or maybe it's gonna be uncomfortable for them that we can have a conversation about a little later. Um, but this one's a pretty simple. You can do it while you're sitting here, we can do it together, and we can just it just takes the water line down. So the idea is you create a box um, and the way Bre Brene describes it is she actually will move her finger on the table as she's doing her box breathing. So another way to get her out of her head and back into her body. So you go basically in two, three, four, and then you hold your breath for two, three, four counts, and then out for four counts, a slow four, and then hold again for four. And we do this a few times, okay? So I am going to stop my share and we are gonna do this together. By the way, great little tool for box breathing is the post-it note. <laughs> so um, you can trace a post-it note with your finger. Um, that's another lovely way to go around the box breathing. Everybody ready? You're just gonna get comfortable, get comfortable in your little, on your little sit bones and kind of wiggle in your chair a little bit. And here we go. We're gonna say, we're gonna start with 
in two three four hold two three four out two three four hold two three four in two three four hold two three four out two three four hold two three four in two three four hold two three four out two three four hold two three four one more in two three four hold two three four out two three four hold two three So what did you notice going through the process of breathing? What changed from before to after? And then also look at your, actually before you, before you answer, look at your problem and from the state that you are in now, see if there's anything available to you about it. Make a note. All right, thoughts about box breathing. I'm going to jump in here. Um, I, I'm assuming this is the same thing as what I heard from Chip Schultz a while ago. Um, and he talked about inhaling and holding and then, and then letting go. And um, I have made it, ever since he said that, it kind of made an impact on me. And so I've made it a practice when I get into bed at night, I go through that to shot, try and shut off my very busy brain um, and just kind of take everything down about 17 notches. Um, so, and, and it's really been helpful. And so in that, in that context, but I never looked at it as, as doing it, quote unquote, during the day when you're trying to make a decision on whatever's bugging you or bothering you or whatever that looks like. So um, I'm, I'm going to kind of take that to heart. I think it, I think it just brings clarity. Awesome. You get rid of all the junk going on in your brain and you just kind of focus on that without bouncing off the walls. Awesome. Yeah. I think we also use it to uh, center ourselves. I know a lot of times someone will come into the office and say, I've got some bad news. And the first thing I want to do is breathe before they say anything. Mm -hmm. Get my mind centered off of everything I've got going on to hear this craziness that's getting ready to happen. So I found that breathing is a good way to, um, to calm me down, to center me, and to leave me open for something new. Awesome. And so that, that's what I found out that it does for me. I yeah, along those, yeah, go ahead, Rick. Yeah, along those same lines, I... I use an acronym PBR and, and it doesn't stand for the beer. Uh, but when, <clears throat> when, so, when then somebody's just gotten some feedback that they, they didn't like, you know, their tendency is to get defensive. So I, I use a, an acronym pause, breathe, respond. And then that, that allows them to consciously, uh, ac actually make their next actions conscious. Right, so it's not a reaction; it's a it's an action, but but you got to put the breathe in there. You to your point, Patrice, because it does put you in a different mind place before you respond, even for that one breath. Yeah, the cool thing about the breathing is that you took time to breathe, which means you do not need to run. Right, right. so right. you're basically telling your brain, "I'm safe," and clearing out whatever that fight or flight response is just done with the amygdala hijack that happens with the whole chem biochemical reaction that's happening in your brain when you're faced with something. 
So I started using this routinely with a client who always comes to our meetings after a day, like, or even a morning or whatever. And he just comes in in a boom. Right. Um, and, and it's, you know, um, coming out of one meeting, moving into the next meeting, doing the thing and da, 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 and all the rat race of the day. And when he comes in at me and he just wants to go ah, me, I'm like, okay, whew, we're going to breathe. And so I started doing box breathing with him. Um, and the first time I did it, I, we, we just went through it once or twice. Um, and it almost like didn't make him uncomfortable enough. So that's why I went four times with you guys. Um, because seriously, there's this way that the, the longer you can stick with it and sort of push that a little bit, the more down people can come off of whatever that crazy is. Um, and the, I know for, for Barrick, the, the client I'm talking about, the, you know, actually being able to draw the square on the table sort of takes his brain to drawing and away from all that other stuff. So it, it really is a way to sort of calm everything down so we can have a cool, humble, you know, just straight up conversation. He can put his thoughts in order better. Um, and it just really, really helps. Um, the PBR thing also, this could also work in those moments when you're in a meeting, things are getting hectic and you need to just take a minute, you know, without running out of the room to calm right? To breathe, to focus on just your breathing. You'll remember what they're talking about. You will. You're really brilliant. So, but you may not remember that not to, you know, what I always say, no, not to throat punch anybody. So this will help with any of those kinds of weird tense moments where you can just take your tension out of your body, all that constriction, breathe and be able to move through. Uh, did anybody notice the difference in their own in, the, in themselves after you went through the exercise? Did you notice anything different physically in yourself? No question about it. What'd you notice, Doug? That kind of breathing really does legitimately slow down the heartbeat. It starts, it starts, to, it take, starts to take the edge off. S Susan, I want to ask a question, and, and if you're planning on going here, then, then I'll skip it and be patient. Um, are you talk? Are you planning on talking about the mechanics of the different kinds of breathing or not? No, I wasn't planning on doing that. Okay. Is there something about it you would like to share? Well, there's something that I dis that I only discovered in a coaching session on Friday night. Um, if you, I, I happen to, I happen to be a mouth breather, which becomes a significant piece for this for this little exercise that I'm going to do. But if you, if you, if you'll join me and take a slow breath in through your mouth and just about the time that you think you're at maximum capacity in terms of air in, close your mouth and breathe through your nose and feel what happened right behind, right at the top of your shoulders, it's almost like you went from filling your lungs to filling the upper area of your shoulder. See if you experience oh, yeah. that with me. Yeah. That little difference between filling your lungs versus feeling like you're filling your shoulders puts all kinds of other things in alignment that I think even enhances where you're going with the vagus nerve. It, 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 it sends additional telegraph. Now I have to learn to do that because as a mouth breather, I don't normally f get that sensation of feeling air filling this space. But I do as soon as, as soon as I breathe through my nose and try to fill up, fill up that way, boom, that whole area is full. So I, I don't know if that's helpful to anybody other, but man, it, it made a big difference to me. I think if you find that you're, if you're a person who finds that your shoulders end up in your ears, I don't know, I'm, I'm like that, where I get, you know, like throughout the day, it's like, rrr, 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 you know, what are they doing up there? That, that's, a, that's a great way to help them deflate. <laughs> like, I feel like, like I inflate them and deflate them on purpose. That's actually really smart. Um, I also just learned um, an abundant, they call it, it's an abundance breathing process actually. Um, and, and in fact, it made me dizzy the first time I, I did it, which, which um, she described as 
that's, you know, lots of life energy that your body isn't used to getting. Um, and therefore, um, that's the reaction that you have is this sort of this dizziness and, um, lightheadedness that goes with it, but it's, um, seven breaths where you, um, breathe in quickly and out slowly. Um, and it's all mouth breathing actually. So it's, you know, basically, a, uh, like, you do that seven times and then you flip it so that you do the in slowly and the out quickly. So it's right. And then you do that seven times with your eyes closed, kind of in a meditative kind of situation. And then, um, I'll tell you when you do it seven and seven at the end of it, I was like, Whoa, um, the expansion, if you allow that, all of that to come into you and, and the expansion that happens from it is, is it's, it's crazy insane. Um, and you just feel that expansion that happens again, rather than constriction, you've got all this expansion of energy and that's, what's inviting, um, a different perspective, right? Um, something you can use within your body versus up here in your, your happy little brain. Wow. So another one there, somebody wants wow. more information about that. Let me know. All right. So we have another technique that I want to jump to. Um, so I'm going to pop back up here and share my screen again. All right. I'm just going to go ahead and move to the next slide here. Wait, okay. I'm screen sharing. Let me do the play. All right. So we've done the breathing. The next one is called perspectives. And this is one where you can get up and move around. Technically, you could probably do it from your chair. Um, but the idea here is that um, you imagine that you and or the client, right, is in the center of this circle. And um, you have eight or more perspectives that you can look at in this pie. So if you think of it, each piece as a different kind of way or a different, you know, kind of way to look at the problem. Um, and as you move to, to check out different pieces, what you notice about the problem um, sort of evolves based on the perspective you take it from. Um, and you might even feel different in different pie pieces as you step in and out of the pie pieces. So typically when I do this with a client in person, we kind of imagine a pie on the floor, um, put the person in, you know, in the middle of it and have them step into one of the pieces and give that piece a name, right? What is this piece? Um, and then whatever that name is, then we explore the problem from that piece, um, see what's available to us in that particular piece, and then move back to the middle and choose a new piece that feels that's, that they're being drawn to, um, move to that piece, see what's available in that piece. So, um, this is a great opportunity if somebody wants to actually kind of do this with us. Um, if somebody wants to talk about the problem that um, they're working through, we can kind of coach and then whatever, kind of whoever gets chosen, right? Um, as you name the pieces, other people can use those names or they can not as they look at their own, um, their own pie. Um, and have you either, honestly the cool part about this one is literally you could have someone spin in their chair as they look at the various pieces if they're not comfortable getting up and doing the thing um otherwise to stand and actually walk through it is um one of the and even to have a client stand on zoom and walk through it is one of the best ways to do it so um is someone willing to play with me on this mm. anybody want to volunteer You don't have to share what the problem is. Just all you have to share as you're looking at pieces is um, what would you name that piece? And then if there's something about what you're noticing in the particular perspective you're standing in um, that you were willing to share, otherwise you can just take notes. It doesn't have to get too crazy. Miss Patrice, I can do it. I don't mind being a guinea pig. Fantastic, Patrice. Thank you very much. I know much. these right. people. I'll see them again one day. Um, <laughs> um, all right. So. Okay. I didn't know what the situation is. I don't mind telling um, you the situation. Can, oh, if you'd like to tell us, that's great. You don't have to. Um, I'm sure they'll have plenty of collective wisdom, though, to support you in, in your coaching. But otherwise, you, guys, you get to just kind of witness and, and look at your own 
Um, I invite you to look at your own problem from the perspectives that Patrice, Patrice is looking at her situation in, okay? Um, and in fact, just give us um, 10 words or less of the problem that you're looking at. The basement is cluttered. Perfect. Upstairs okay. is great. Kitchen, living room, great. Basement cluttered. Okay, perfect. Basin's cluttered. Beautiful. All right. So, are you willing to stand up with me and work through this, or do you want to do it from your where you what? What do you what do we do? If it's okay if I sit here. Yeah, it's perfectly fine. Okay. Okay. So, um, so what I'd like you to do is, is as you think about around you, you're in the middle, right? And your chair yeah. is kind of swiveling around this pie. Um, turn yeah. yourself to a pie piece and okay. give it a name. Um. Family junk. Family junk, perfect. So look around in your family junk and what's available to you here about the solution to your problem? The solution of the problem. So, <laughs> well, it's it's really what what is what is in this space and how does it inform you about this problem? Um, uh, it informs me that I need to say no to my family as far as after they die, we just need to throw it all away or at least all of it except for a box. Okay, so there's some information that to gather from looking at the stuff in that particular pie piece. Yes. Okay, all right, good. All right, so pick the, look. turn all the way around and look at the pie piece behind you. I'm just having an instinct about this. Okay. <sighs> what do you, take a breath and uh, get yourself settled in looking at what's in that space. Um, what's, what's that space? Old office furniture. <laughs> okay, old office furniture, great. Um, and as you look around at the office furniture that is old, um, what what does that tell you about, or what, what, what does that have to inform you about your problem? Um, that I need to let go. And, and even if I don't get any money out of it, just get it out of my basement. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how does that feel? Good to let go. I just gotta it, let it go. It's work. It's anxiety. It's work to get rid of all this crap. Okay. Very. Thank you for being really, really honest. Okay. So find a space in your pie that stands for the anxiety that it takes to get rid of this crap. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So hang out in the anxiety space for a minute. Tell me about it. Um. I've given the anxiety a name. Okay. It's called Just Bunny Betty. <laughs> and I want Just Bunny Betty out of my life. I want to claim okay. Wow. Yeah, because you gave her a funny name, but she's not so funny, is she? She's Just Bunny Betty. Y'all know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> We laugh, but it's it's sort of not funny, right? Like it's but you said yeah. name it, and I've named it Dust Bunny Betty. I love it. Okay, that's fantastic. All right. So and everybody else is looking at their problem going, okay, if I'm looking at this and it's Dust Bunny Betty, what is how does that inform you, right? If that space is called Dust Bunny Betty, how does that space inform you about your problem? Okay. <laughs> Trust that it, there's something there for you. Okay. It informs yeah. me that it informs me that I just need to go ahead and just get it done. The anxiety of it all is is I want to declare my basement back for me instead of all this other stuff. Yeah. And then I'm realizing from what we're talking about is that I have to have help. Fantastic. Someone who's not attached to it. Oh, good. So um Perfect. Yeah. What else? Um, someone that's not attached to it. Um, and then if I go to another one, because I went to another one after I got yeah. through with that's Buddy Betty. I yeah, got these books. Things. I got these books. I got these books. They're everywhere. You know, I love reading. I love books. And I've got to get rid of all these books. So I've got to, uh, I think getting rid of the books will help me declutter a lot. Awesome. So find another open space um, that feels like, I don't know, amazing. Like, like it's done. It's fabulous. It's just, that's it's called a yummy clean, feeling. Really that's yummy. called clean Clara. Clean Clara. 
outstanding. I love it. That is awesome. Doug is Tell dying. Me what it feels like. Doug is dying. Tell me what I it am. feels like to hang out with clean Clara. It feels <laughs> liberating. It feels freeing. It feels like I can breathe a little bit more. It feels um um it feels if I gave it a a a, a feeling, it would be like peace and joy and uh, and comfort, happiness. It, it cleanliness to me is happiness. I mean, I don't I love when my bathrooms are clean. I love when my whole house is clean. So I think it's a feeling of happiness. That is awesome. And it is makes me feel like other- Fantastic. Is there any other space in your pie that we still need to visit or are you complete? We do. We got one more space, Dave Nabbit. And that's the <laughs> one that deals with in the paperwork area. It deals with getting rid of those things that are classified. So, you know, uh-huh. things that are confidential, close hold. And I'm, I'm, you know, calling the people from the shredded place and just letting them have me hold a, a container until I finish filling it up. So, okay. You know, it's when we're talking about it's helping me get resolved on a few things. If I push out a little bit, I can get to clean Clara, but it's a couple of steps I got to make. Linda yeah, is dying. Linda? <laughs> <laughs> but I I'm, I want to point out something. And there's, there's it's interesting as I'm listening to your voice as you're ta- even talking about these spaces. There's, you went from this really lovely light place hanging with clean Clara. And then when you started talking about that paperwork again, it just went, Ugh. Yeah. Anybody else notice that? Like there's this whole energy shift that happened. Um, and so so I can, we're going to go from really... Dust Bunny Betty to Shred Betty, huh? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Something's got to happen there, right? So, yeah. So, um, so notice. Yeah, yes. so, <laughs> thank you for doing this. Anything else in your pie that we need to talk about? Have we covered the whole pie? If we covered the pie, uh, I think that... Um, I think um, having an emotional tie to things is something that I have to really look at and find uh, and and change some of my belief systems. Not that it's true or false, but my belief is that if I maintain things that belong to people I love, that part of them are with me, and I still think I can do it with one or two pieces instead of a whole bunch of their stuff that's still here. <laughs> yeah. Good. You're just going to love, you're you're not going to love them any less, are you? That's right. Right. No, love it. Beautiful. What a great shift that was. That That was like a whole shift that happened. Fantastic. (laughs) Yay. I know it's a hard one too. You probably have to do it a couple more times um, (laughs) to really really let that land. That was a hard one. I'm telling you, I have boxes I go through every year and I throw more away. but, you know, it's unpacking some of these things that I thought were, in, you know, and in, in really getting to the stuff that really, truly I want to hang on to. And I understood it. And I understood it a little bit more because I'm retired military and I'm used to them picking me up and moving me every two to three to four years. And I have moved in 20. So I've got stuff. My son says, oh, mama, you don't need to hold on to anything else. So <laughs> I have to get rid of stuff. I mean, upstairs, you can never know that the basement looks like it does. So. And I think that's a clear sign that I need to to start uh, spring cleaning in uh, the end of February. Yeah. So, so what action do you want to take first? What's the next right action for you on this? Uh, the these- next right action is um, is just to um, get get the books packed up. If I get books packed up, and knowing that I'm giving away the the people to read. And, and I think that part of my, my understanding is that I can't grow until I let go. And so when I start letting go of things, then things come to me. And I don't want to block my blessings by not letting go of things that I need to, to go ahead and move on to someone else. Yeah. So, um, so just play with me for a second. Just, I want you to close your eyes and imagine books going out and blessings coming in and create that cycle of flow. Just feel what it is like for that to be happening. Notice where it shows up from your head down to your toes and let it fill your whole body with the joy of watching books go out and blessings come in.
when you've got the feeling of how awesome that is, let me know. Hold on to it for a second so you can recreate it. I got it. Awesome. Okay, so I have a challenge for you. And that is, as you start to clear books, right, and let them go, if you can connect to this energy each time you make that choice to let one go and do it from that space as much as you can. Will you accept the challenge? I do. Let's go out, blessings come in. Absolutely. From that feeling. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for doing that with us. That was wonderful. And being vulnerable and playing with me. That was, that was pretty amazing. Hey, Patrice, mm -hmm. one thing you may be able to do to get to that, to get that feeling whenever you want, while you're sitting here in the room, just having this thing, stare at where your, where your walls meet your ceiling just for a second. And, and just, and put that, just really, just really quickly re rethink about that that joy of creating while you're staring at that where the ceiling meets the walls just would you just anchor in that feeling of joy that happens when you're in the flow zone there got it awesome nice ad that's another reinforcement thank you doug yeah yeah so you again, can't get you can't idea. get depressed you can't get depressed when your eyes are above eye level Exactly. That's awesome. It's that physically, awesome. Uh, it's physiologically impossible. Yep. Uh, looking up versus looking down. Exactly. So again, going back to the first slide where we talk about the strength of an emotional experience, right? Um, and how it connects to the brain. You can, feelings you can choose whenever you want, right? So you can choose to be in this glorious flow anytime you want to be in that glorious flow. Um, and so, um, and the more you spend time there, the easier it is to access and the more your experience literally will be that. So that's how this, this is how this all sort of comes work. So we do want to anchor it, but we also want to be back in it again. So the more we experience it, the more we connect to it and the more we will actually create it in our lives. So yeah, very cool. Other thoughts, questions, things that came up as we went through, Patrice and I went through that, um, that little process. Anybody uh, do any self coaching around their own perspectives and come up with anything? I, I got to admit, I did. Susan, did you happen to see what I put in the chat? I did. The six hats. I used that too. Mm -hmm. I was, when you were talking about having perspectives, if somebody doesn't know what you're thinking about, I'm wondering if we could steal some of De Bono stuff and at least have six of the eight stuff perspectives as a tool. Yeah. Yes. Success is a great little thing to me. Um, sometimes it can be more head, less body. So the whole idea of moving to different spaces just helps to add that body connection. So, yeah. um, if you put on a hat <laughs> and look at yourself in the mirror, that never had on that can work. And like, you know, again, how, how can we in introduce the body into it is the question. I like that a lot. Okay. Other thoughts on the, before I hit you with the last one, we got one more to do quick here. All right. I'm going to go ahead and jump to the last one then. Um, as I share one more time. And the last one is literally body position. Um, and we've done a little bit of this at different um, power summits and different things where we, we have people move and kind of get into different body positions. Um, Again, the idea of, we talked already about constriction versus expansion, right? And so you notice even in these body positions, some of them are more constricted, some of them are more expanded. Um, and, you know, basically how we take up space and how we, where, in what body position we are in as we are addressing the problem in front of us actually matters. To Doug's point about looking up versus looking down. Um, even that kind of a shift can matter in terms of our perspective about a problem. Um, something else that I think is difficult for us to do is to just soften. Um, 
and, and so the first thing I'm going to ask you to do as part of the body position is just in the position you are in is just make an effort to let your body just soften. So notice as you start to work from head to toe, kind of softening everything all the way down, um, notice where you have tension. That could be an interesting thing to pay attention to. Um, notice if there are parts that you are sensitive about letting be soft. Um, notice if there are places that don't, that are, are still tight, that can give you in, information about um, your problem and, and, and what's happening within you in, in, in relation to it. But just giving yourself permission to just soften rather than go at things hard, which is sort of how we're conditioned, um, can be another part of this idea of body position. So, all right, so body position. See, there's some fun, fun ones here. This, you know, legs up on the desk kind of thing can be fun for people in an office. Um, there's a yoga pose there where, you know, it's a hard opening position. Um, but a lot of times when we're dealing with problems, we're doing, we're doing this. We're looking down and we got our head wrapped in our hands and we're kind of staring at things like this. Um, and there's just so much constriction in this space. Um, closing our hands versus opening to the possibilities. And of course I have my Superman pose over that one. I am, you know, a master of the universe. Um, the little guy curled up in a ball, um, just kind of holding it all in. Believe it or not, you can really learn a lot from holding it all in um, and figuring out, you know, where things are actually, um, you know, where the most tension is within your body and then how you loosen that up and how that changes things. But it really does when you start to look at your body position, how someone is sitting, how they're holding themselves, you know, all of that can inform um, what's happening with, with a problem that you're trying to solve. But also as a coach, when you're coaching someone, paying attention to what's happening with them, if they're doing whatever else they're doing with their body can be really helpful. Um, so I'm gonna invite you now to try a couple of body positions. Um, so consider, what's going on with the problem you're trying to solve and change your orientation. Um, I have gotten some great insight by laying on the floor um, and looking up at the ceiling and something will come, right? So um, just, I invite you to get up out of your chair to move around, move to a different part of your office, stand a different way um, and uh, just move a little and see what movement does to how you're approaching your problem. Yeah, move around. Check on a different part of your room. Go stare out the window for a second. Move your head, look up in a corner. Um, curl up as tight as you can be and constrict absolutely every piece of your body into a little ball. You can do this one in your chair. And then pull yourself back out of it. Take up space. We are meant to take up space, people. <laughs> so take up some space. And then come back to your problem and see what it see what your body has to say. Or see what your mind has to say now that your body is all chilled out. So yeah, a simple shift in body position can actually change our perspective of something. Anybody get something new? Oh yeah. Yep. Now, this is real simple. I tend to slouch when I'm thinking about something. And if I stand up straight, it's more action oriented than thought oriented. Yeah. Anybody walk while they coach? I tend to, if I'm on the phone, there's one thing bum oh. that's a bummer about Zoom is I like to walk. 
Um, and so I tend to think that I think better on my feet, but I can't just be standing there. I got to move. Um, so I think, I know my, my clients think I'm incredibly animated because I can't move myself. <laughs> it's like, if I, if, if my, if my feet can't move, something's going to move. Like, so this is how this is going to work. Um, but I, I did notice the shift that when we went to zoom, I was like, wow, I like, I have to move. I gotta, you know, move myself around in my own chair. I lean forward, I lean back. I'm always constantly moving. Um, and that just, if I'm losing, like when I'm up on my feet and walking with a client, I tend to be more intense with them and more intent on what they're saying. Um, zoom has a way of lulling me like, like, you know, squirrel, you know, that kind of thing. So I really have to be, um, I really have to be purposeful about it and just moving a little, moving myself around a little bit helps me stay with them. So, um, the good, way the good news is I've always mind. talked, the good news is I've always talked with my hands. So that kind of helps. Yeah, me too. And I still you know, do. Whether I'm on Zoom or not, I still yeah. do. Yeah. 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 <laughs> just nobody could see it before when I was going, oh, over here, you know, <laughs> But, you know, my clients are cool with it. It's all good. Um, and I just tell them, this is how I am. I'm gonna, I think it keeps them going too, quite frankly. If I'm moving around, it helps them relax um, because they're stuck here doing this square thing on Zoom too, right? Yeah. So what else did you notice about moving? Just moving your body. It really, it really, is, a different, it really is a different perspective. Um, a couple of things. Uh, as some of you know, I, I have, I go to two different tap dancing classes and um, one that I go to the, um, the teacher also teaches yoga. So she makes a point of doing some stretching and that kind of stuff before and also at the end of the class. And, and it really makes um, a huge difference, a huge difference and little things like you know, today, uh, especially on days when I'm glued to this little box thing here, I'm exo I get so tired by about four o'clock in the afternoon, I want to die. Now I have a tap class at five o'clock, 5.30 today. No, five o'clock. And so many days I'll be here and I'm going, oh God, I am so tired. I just like, bleh. But I drag myself out the door and it's the best half an hour I could ever spend. And I come home feeling so much better. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? A little bit of movement. It is. Yeah. It is. Well, very cool. Well, we are wrapping up. People are kind of dropping off, which is cool. I just have one last thing to leave you with today, and that is what you focus on the longest becomes the strongest. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Go Thank forth you. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Thanks for playing with me. Thanks again, Patrice. Appreciate it. Thank you, Bye. Susan. Have a great rest of the day, folks. Thanks, Susan. Bye.